Hi everyone. For this talk, I looked at the last eight years or so of research regarding observing vestibular schwannoma, specifically looking at meta-analyses and systematic reviews, as well as randomized trials and evidence-based guidelines, and lastly, large cohort studies to gather some information for you, and in this short talk, hopefully communicate a few ideas that might help you better treat and counsel your vestibular schwannoma patients that you're observing. Now we'll talk in this uh, in the next few minutes about newer ideas regarding epidemiology, some ideas about which or what number of vestibular schwannomas grow in a cohort and how we can talk to our patients about growth rates and how we can counsel them about this, and also about hearing preservation and what the likelihood of hearing preservation is in our observed vestibular schwannoma patients and how we can subclassify this. And lastly, I'll touch on a couple of uh, important studies that look at quality of life and the cost to the health to the healthcare system as a whole when we're comparing observing to surgery to radiation therapy. So let's begin. Now, when we're talking about medical epidemiology, we typically talk about incidence, just to remind you, as new diagnoses over a particular period of time and quite classic this is cl quite classically this is the number of new diagnoses per person years and when we're talking about prevalence this is the total disease burden or the total number of diagnoses in a community at a given point in time so quite traditionally we used to think of or um, talk about vestibular schwannoma incident rates around one in a hundred thousand but here's some interesting global collaborative data that uh, demonstrates a significantly higher all-age incidence of 1 in 20,000. And a couple of larger centers around the world no, um, here included in this group. And the authors noted that there's been obviously an increase in MRI. So this is part of the reason that we're seeing an increase in diagnosis. But look at the rate in the plus 70 group. This is an incidence rate of 1 in 5,000. And one particular cohort that was studied from Minnesota, from the Mayo group, had a lifetime prevalence of 1 in 500, uh, sorry, 1 in 5,000. In this group, and this is the paper from the Mayo group uh, which was describing this incidence rate, they aggregated data and reconciled data from temporal bone studies, from radiological and popula population-based studies. And they noted, like all of us that have a lot of vestibular schwannoma patients that we're caring for, that the average age of diagnosis is increasing and the average size at diagnosis is decreasing. So they actually called for a change or a paradigm shift in thinking about how we manage vestibular schwannoma, where, say, 30 or 40 years ago, it was largely a surgical disease. Then as radiation came into the fore, it became surgery and radiation. And now we have an older population with comorbidities, and maybe we should be thinking of this as chronic disease management. And as you'll see in the upcoming slides, this is where the bulk of patients are actually not treated. We're just observing them over time. And this probably resonates with a lot of you who manage um, a lot of vestibular schwannoma patients. Now, we're all familiar with this, but this is from the Neurological Evidence, Neurological Surgeons Evidence-Based Guidelines from 2017. And the commonest presentation for vestibular schwannoma is, of course, hearing loss. And this is, the, this is the recommended guidelines for patients with asymmetry for requesting an MRI. And this is two frequencies, 10 decibels, one frequency, 15 decibels, or unilateral tinnitus. And, of course... When we're ordering the MRIs, the, the evidence-based guidelines suggest a high-resolution T2 or a contrasted weighted T1 image. And a recent meta-analysis casts some doubt over that. As you all know, there, there are some small risks with gadolinium, with uh, nephrogenic fibrosis, and with also with uh, allergic reactions. So maybe not every patient requires gadolinium, but they, the authors did note that this can really help in differentiating vestibular schwannoma from uh, meningioma. Whether this is relevant in the smaller, uh, smaller lesion is uh, a different discussion. But when we're looking at cohorts of patients, here's a large study from the Cambridge group published last year, and they looked at their cohort of patients, over 350, and wanted to determine what were the predictors of uh, growth. And they saw in their cohort between 30 to 50 percent of lesions, or more specifically 40 percent, grew in this group. And the strongest predictor for growth was growth in the first year. 
and it was lesions that were extra canalicular that grew most compared to smaller vestibular schwannomas and the lesions that grew the least were the intracanalicular lesions but all of this became equal in terms of disease location and growth rates after the first year we actually looked and published last year on intracanalicular vestibular schwannoma and had sub-analyses for observing versus radiation versus surgery. And in our meta-analysis, we had 24 uh, studies of observation and with a mean follow-up of four years, about a third of these patients grew. So if you have patients with small lesions or intracanalicular lesions, you can estimate approximately one-third to 40% of your cohort as you're observing them with at least a four-year up to even a 10-year follow-up will, uh, will likely grow, which leaves a large burden that won't grow. And importantly, in our, our meta-analysis, we saw that around 2% actually involuted in this observation period. Here's some interesting work just published uh, this year from uh, Mass, uh, Massachusetts and uh, Boston. And this was a subset of 99 intracanalicular vestibular schwannomas. And the authors here wanted to look at lesions that tended not to grow within the intracanalicular group. So looking for subsets within the intracanalicular lesions that tended not to grow. They had quite a long mean follow-up of 6.1 years uh, with a range up to greater than 10 years. And they found that fundal lesions or lesions with... Uh, less than 100 millimeters cubed in terms of volume tended not to grow. So this is a useful metric for us to carry over to our uh, patients when we have intracanalicular lesions. But if you have a patient where the lesion is more lateral towards the fundus or small on presentation, it's less likely to grow over that 6 to 10 year period. Here's an interesting paper recasting some of the information that was published uh, from the Cambridge group looking at conditional probability. So what the authors wanted to do here was try and give some useful information when a patient first presents with a vestibular schwannoma for counselling, giving them an idea of the likelihood of growth. So they looked at regression analysis and Bayesian probability. And in their cohort of 350 patients, as I mentioned, around 40% grew, 60% did not grow, and they had a mean diagnosis, uh, sorry, mean age at diagnosis of 67 and here the authors had up to 10 years of follow-up here and they found when they looked at their regression analysis that the likelihood of growth in the first year is 21 percent and this decreases almost in, in an asymptotic way towards uh to when when the patient's at five years so in other words if they come to you uh in the first year. You can tell them if it hasn't grown by the fifth year, then there's less than a 2% chance that it'll grow beyond that with the current understanding. So this is quite useful information. And the take-home summary here is basically, if the lesion doesn't grow, particularly in the first year, and it hasn't grown by the second or third year, then as the years go on, it becomes less likely that it'll grow. And this is quite comforting for a lot of patients and good for us to communicate as clinicians. Now, what can we do to try and help reduce growth? And there was some initial quite a lot of interest from this Harvard Public uh, public School of Health uh, work that came out in the mid-2010s saying that they, they looked at a cohort study, comparative cohort study, where they saw that in a cohort where the lesions were not growing, there seemed to be a higher amount of aspirin being taken. And with a recent meta-analysis, this seems to have been disproved. We we uh, probably need more information, but note that in the Neurological Surgeon's Guidelines from 2017, they did suggest that it may be considered for use in patients that are undergoing observation. But I would say there's still more prospective studies leaded with larger controlled studies before we can say this, say this more definitively. What about with hearing preservation? Here's some nice work published this year, again from the Mayo Group. They did a systematic review and covered 3,650 patients. And from 26 studies, they had a mean follow-up of some four years. And they gave us a very nice way of remembering the likelihood of serviceable hearing retention. So for our neurosurgical colleagues, this is hearing which is retained, which we can treat typically with hearing aids. And you can see at three years, the likelihood if we observed a vestibular schwannoma that the hearing is preserved is quite high. It's at 75%. And this drops to 60% at five years and at 10 years, some 40%. One important point to make with this study is that remember the mean age of these patients is getting up to the mid-60s, possibly even up to 68. 
And so we can't discount the fact that there could be natural aged hearing loss or presbycusis that could overlay the effect of the tumor. In other words, the effect of tumor observation is less on hearing than we may have thought. And this is a very hard thing to exclude from a study, but still worthwhile uh, making note of that observing vestibular schwannomas likely doesn't affect the hearing that much. So just to finish, a couple of interesting comparative studies. The first one looking at quality of life. And I bring this one up again from the Mayo Group because it's high quality data. It's the first prospective study, 251 patients. And they used a disease-specific instrument, the PEN Acoustic Neuroma Quality of Life instrument. And this was a surprising finding for me. They compared the quality of life outcomes for surgery, radiation therapy, and observing. And they found no difference between the treatment groups for general health, energy, total pain, facial nerve function, balance, and hearing. Surprisingly, the only statistically significant reduction in anxiety score occurred in the microsurgical group. But when we think about this, this could be a self-selected group of patients. We all know, those of us that treat a lot of vestibular schwannoma, that the anxious patients sometimes select for surgery early. And this is, in fact, confirmed with some patient motivation studies that the same group did earlier in 2018, looking at the motivations for vestibular schwannoma tra treatment. And of course, the number one reason, and we all probably intuit this, is the, is the doctor recommendation. 50% of patients will elect for the vestibular schwannoma treatment based on what the doctor says. But look at the number two and three reasons. For observation, it was to avoid side effects and symptoms not severe. For radiation, again, fairly intuitive, less invasive, quicker recovery. For microsurgical remover, they didn't want the tumor in their head, so likely an anxious patient. And so prospectively, if we exclude that data, if we just go back to the previous uh, study, if we exclude, if we recognize that the surgical group had a higher baseline of anxiety, after treatment, all of the anxiety levels were equal between the groups, but that's probably because the surgical group started off with a higher anxiety level. And lastly, comparing observation to radiation and to surgery. And here this is looking at total lifetime cost to the healthcare system. And it was with, uh, assuming this was with high quality research done with the Healthcare Policy Research Institute at the Mayo Group as well. And the idea here was looking at the best um, treatment from a lifetime cost perspective to the healthcare system for a hypothetical small to medium vestibular schwannoma in a 50 year old patient. And here I would have assumed that if you did definitive treatment and treated the lesion and it was all finished with treatment, then that would likely be less expensive. But in fact, the results were the exact opposite, that observation with radiation therapy for growth was the least expensive. And remember, this is costing, assuming that we don't have follow-up data beyond 10 years. But the most expensive is what I assumed would be the cheapest, and that is upfront microsurgical uh, treatment. So just some interesting thoughts for us as clinicians. So in summary, we might need to recast our thinking on the epidemiology of vestibular schwannoma and with MRI and with increasing uh, diagnoses with older patients, rethink how we think about this disease as more like a chronic disease management with all age incidence being around 1 in 20,000 and possible lifetime prevalence of around 1 in 5,000. About 40% of your cohort that you're observing will likely eventually grow and these are typically lesions that grow in the first year and present extra canalicula. And this is an interesting point. When a patient first comes to you, you can tell them that the likelihood of growth is probably around 20%. And if they haven't, the lesion hasn't grown by five years, then there's a less than a 2% chance that it'll grow. So they can likely not think about it too much. And the probability of service, uh, serviceable hearing retention at three years is around, it's quite high, around 75%. At uh, five years, still quite high at 60%, and at 10 years, around 40%. So we need to think um, and, and apply these figures to our patients when we're talking about active treatments in the form of radiation therapy and surgery. So with that, thanks, uh, thanks for watching, and uh, we'll see you soon.